What's going on, everybody? I'm about to go live with Ryan Blair. Super excited for it. All right. What's going on, everyone tuning in? Hope everyone is having a fantastic day. I am about to go live with Ryan Blair, and if you guys are tuning in right now, make sure you stay tuned because Ryan sold his last company for over $700 million, and we're going to be talking about what's happening right now, and to, I'm going to be getting his thoughts on what's happening in the society as it stands. So stay tuned. Ryan will be coming in, and it's going to be a great time, so make sure you bring your questions because we're gonna have a great conversation. What up, Kenzo? What up, Chris? What up, FaZe Blaze, Jake? We got the squad in here. So uh, stay tuned. For everyone tuning in right now, Ryan Blair is coming in, and <laughs> I wouldn't mind 700 million, right? What up, Babin? How do you feel about quarantine? I have been in my apartment um, for the past, I would say, three weeks. Just kicking it here. We got the squad in here. Paul Herbusters is in here. What up? All right, we're going to bring in Ryan Blair. One second. Good to see you. Ryan, what's going on? Good to see you, man. How's quarantine? Hey, it, it's good. I'm just uh, in Scottsdale right now. I've, I've been here for the past, you know, two weeks. How, how are you? I'm fantastic. I'm in my house in the Hollywood Hills, you know. I love it's it. Work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I've been excited about this because I know Brian helped set this up, but I'm fascinated because you're someone that understands not only the financial markets, but you've sold your last company for over $700 million. And I would love to get your thoughts really to just kick this off of what's happening right now and what you believe this situation is going to come out to be, whether that's a recession or if it's just something that's happening and everyone's overhyped. Like, what is your thoughts as someone that understands financial markets and yeah. has been through a recession and built a company in one? Yeah, well, just by way of background for the audience, um, I started my career right when the dot-com boom happened in 1999. So I'm 42 years old. And after the dot-com boom, there was a bust and all of us had to scramble recalibrate our businesses, make some big changes. Then 9-11 happened and I was just raising money for my telecom company, which is called Sky Pipeline during 9-11. And uh, when I, I remember I secured my first investor for 75,000 and the next thing you know, 9-11 happens and all the investors I was working with and the whole market for telecom went into disruption and turmoil. Uh, then after that, I'd started a company called Vysalis in 2005, got some momentum and sold it in a uh, multi-year earnout situation in 2008. And then the uh, financial crisis of 2008, 2009 hit literally the month after I sold it. Um, so I, I've had a lot of experience, you know, adjusting and adapting to the marketplace. I'll tell you right now though, this is the biggest event that has ever happened to any of us. We have yet to even understand the complications that are going to arise from this uh, as entrepreneurs, as citizens as fathers as i am as parents you know this is this is up there with the great depression in terms of the complications and this yep. is going to change our culture this is going to change the way we view our health it's going to change the way we we thought like we could make money and make a living so this is a traumatic event yep. and we have yet to even feel the effects of it yet and so right now a lot of people are just still acting the same way still kind of going about business the same way and, yep. you know, just kind of crossing their fingers, hoping times are going to get better. But I'll, I'll tell you that the people that are going to really survive and thrive in this are the ones that are willing to deal with the brutal, honest truth about their reality and the situation that presents itself right now. Got it. It's interesting. What's your thoughts on just everything from a quarantine perspective? Obviously, you're in L.A. and it's really locked down over there. How long do you think this is going to last in terms of just the initial lockdown of what's happening? Yeah. It's going to last a long time. Um, and the reason why is because people are not respecting the fact that like I can save a life by not getting sick. So people don't respect that yet. And so unfortunately, there's a lot of people that are that are making fun of this or making light of it. And I have some friends that are working on the front lines. In fact, one of my private clients is a they provide nurses on the front line. And another one of my friends is a surgeon. And when you hear what they're going through right now and understanding the amount of death, the amount of pain they're seeing, even from young, healthy people, 
Like we were told not to worry about it if you're young and healthy. But yep. those of us that are young and healthy, we all have people that we're related to or we love and care about that aren't. And so it's our job to, you know, to stay in and do our duty not to even potentially catch this thing, even if it's mild for us, we might pass it on to someone else where it becomes a, you know, a, a life ending consequential event. And until we really as a society figure that out, we're gonna keep having um, starts and stops of this thing. And yeah, so, you know, I, I, I see every negative as positive. So I wanna make sure everybody understands, like if you really look at the negative for what it is, you can turn it into positive. But when you turn blind eye, a blind eye to the negativity or you dismiss it is when it really catches you off guard. Got it. And it's, it's so interesting. I mean, I, I think I'm also, I want to ask just what's your advice to entrepreneurs and business owners during this time, whether that's brick yeah. and mortar or an online business, like how do companies adapt right now? Because there's so many different regulations happening and things shutting down. Yeah. Like what, what advice do you give to, to entrepreneurs throughout this period? Yeah, well, the thing, so the thing that changed Vice House is the trajectory. We went from a company that was about to go out of business doing 600,000 a month to 65 million a month in 18 months. We're the fastest growing company in the history of the NYSE. And we did over 100 million in profit per year during that period of time. The thing that changed us is we met the new consumer. So we knew the consumer was changing. We knew the consumer was gonna be deal oriented. They're gonna look for pricing. They were going to seek value. It was a buyer's marketplace, right? From a seller's marketplace to a buyer's marketplace. And so we knew the consumer was going to change. And so we adapted our business model to that change very quickly. Now, all of your competitors in the marketplace, regardless of what industry you're in, the larger the competitor, the more time they're gonna to have to spend in retraction. They're gonna to have to worry about laying off employees. They're gonna to have to worry about canceling contracts, canceling events, canceling conferences canceling all of the things and the infrastructure that they had built for many companies have built it for you know, 10, 20, 30 years. The CEO of that company is now you know, having a very difficult life. And so they're not focused on new market share. They're not focused on new customer acquisition. They're just trying to save what they've got. And so everyone in this period of time is gonna go through a period of trying to save. And that's gonna give a entrepreneur with a new company or a small company an opportunity to take market share, where you know, your formidable competitors, they're gonna be plagued with difficult decisions, and that's gonna drain a lot of their energy away from the creativity and the innovation that they should be doing to meet the new marketplace. So you have to come up with a new strategy. You have to assume all of the rules that you've built and all of the assumptions that you built your business on are null, are null and void. So like if you figured that, oh, it only costs you $200 to acquire a customer through Facebook advertising. You yep. need to go retest that assumption because the marketplace has changed. And so you're gonna have to go back in and tear up your business model and th rethink everything, every assumption, every key driver, and then build a new business model based on your new testing and your new assumptions, right? You have to create a new assumption, new pricing, new yep. strategy, right. new value proposition. You're gonna have to test that. And then you're gonna have to continue to evolve that as uh, the marketplace evolves. And so there's gonna be events, there's gonna be job reports coming out every week that's gonna change people's consumer sentiment. And we are, we are an economy based on consumption. So like that's what the American economy is, it's based totally. on consumption. So the consumer has changed. And so you have to adapt and you have to change to meet that new consumer where they're at right now. And I can't tell you how everyone who thinks they know how to talk to this new consumer has no idea. We all have to equally adapt and learn you know, where the marketplace is. And the bigger you are as a company, the more you're gonna to have to make these adaptations because the entire uh, foundation and infrastructure that you built your company on is no longer um, gonna sell the same way that it used to by any means. I mean, it's gonna sell yep. a, tenth of, a tenth of what it used to. Got it, and that's so interesting too. And I know I'd, I'd love for you to talk about AlterCall as well in terms of the company you're building right now because I know you guys do a lot of live events and yeah. obviously not many yeah. people are traveling right now. So I'd yeah. love for you to touch on that from a personal perspective of yeah. how you guys are altering things and changing up the way you guys do business. Yeah, so my, my entire business model got completely screwed. <laughs> <laughs> like everything that I was doing, I got to redo basically and rethink and... Um, you know, but I look at it as though, you know, I had, so we did seven, what we call transformation day experiences. 
where I'd fly people, people would fly into my home. It was a high ticket event. Uh, we would take them through various uh, transformational processes to then send them back as entrepreneurs and you know, get them into an elevated and an activated state. And so now I'm, I'm refactoring those things, uh, refactoring the pricing, refactoring the, 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 the methods, refactoring how we reach people. And you know, I'm, I'm seeking to reach people in the comfort of their own homes where you know, putting together um, live events and virtual summits and virtual yep. uh, types of courses to replace what we were doing in person because we just can't do in person related items. So yep. we're still gonna hold true to our values though. We're not gonna pivot completely to a whole nother category. We're just gonna figure out how to deliver what we were delivering in the comfort of people's homes virtually. Some, some businesses though have to pivot because they're no yep. longer applicable. Like if you were selling restaurants, how to acquire customers, you're gonna have to pivot because the amount of restaurants and you know, how they acquire customers is gonna completely change. Or you'll have to pivot and create a whole new offering for a new type of restaurant that didn't yep. maybe exist before. So like, there's a lot of people that have no choice. They gotta take what they learned and they gotta make a big pivot. I've done that before. In the recession of 2008, I had a software, I had a social networking company called PathConnect that I pivoted into a B2B. It was a B2C company. And in 2008, you could raise money for B2C. But in 2009, nobody cared about B2C anymore. Yeah. So I had to go to B2B and I made that pivot B2B and the software company did over hundred million in sales as a result of that pivot. But had I kept with the, you know, the current course, I would have had yeah. to shut it down completely. Interesting. And I'm curious, where do you see is the opportunity right now that people may not see based on the experience you have with, you know, seeing around corners, what would you say yeah. that is? Uh, Yep. Well, one, people are going to value their health a lot more. Mm. People are going to value their immune system. So there's opportunity to teach people. I mean, a lot of the stuff that this virus is exposing is going to convert, conversely create an opportunity. So anytime you're, you're put into a stressful situation, so you know, entrepreneurship is about solving problems. Yep. So this virus has created a whole lot of new problems. So all you have to do is ask yourself as an entrepreneur, what new problems have been created at scale, like big problems? And then now, is there anybody solving this problem now? Like, you know, I joke as a more introverted person, I'm a writer, as you know, I love to write, I like to be alone and I like to write. <laughs> Extroverted people, they need, you know, community, they need connection, they need to augment the structure and the systems that they put around in their lives. Um, employees that lived on structure all day long you know, and then they came home to escape the, the structure. Now we're going to need to find structure in their homes. Um, people are going to need to rethink the environment that they're in in their homes. So there's a lot of things that will emerge and a lot of services and products that will emerge that people are going to be more interested in now because of the problem that this uh, virus is going to create. And the amount of problems this is going to create is just at the very beginning. Like we don't understand the cultural changes yep. like how long am i going to avoid people and try yeah. to stay away like if i'm like, taking a walk i want to be six feet away from people <laughs> right like that yeah. was never the case and so it's going to be a while until i have confidence the virus is gone that there's a cure that there's a vaccine and that could be according to government resource uh, uh, government scientists that could be 18 months until people are starting to have some relief in terms of the way they conduct themselves and and yeah. the way we gather socially so that's gonna create a need in the marketplace that wasn't there. And the neat part about that is the opportunity, like everything that, you know, that existed two weeks ago is now <laughs> reset. Like we have BC, like, you know, they say there was like before common era yeah. <laughs> or before Christ for people who are biblical, right? Now we have BC again, before Corona. <laughs> and like literally everything yeah. before Corona is null and void. Now yeah. we just have after Corona, AC. I like Okay. And people are not going to care about anything before Corona. It's just going to be what was there after Corona. Interesting. And I want to make sure too, if people are in here, um, if you want to ask questions, make sure you do that. But I'm curious, like the day people will say, okay, when things are back to normal, you know, when is that going to be? Do you believe that things will be back to normal? Like you said, before Corona, or will this be something that transforms like civilization and how people respond and go out and go out to eat. Like what's your thoughts on like the human yeah. behavior aspect of this whole thing? It's never going to go back to normal. Interesting. Uh, yeah. There's, there's a whole change that's occurring 
And that change was very necessary. And, you know, it's going to change a lot of people for the negative. A lot of people are going to, this event is going to be their, their downfall and their demise. And they're going to no longer be normal like they were. And a lot of people are going to thrive in this event. And they're going to utilize this adversity to create a new them, a, a new business model, a new way of conducting themselves, like new harmony in their lives. They're going to seek, you know, they're going to seek not to escape their reality of their home, but they're going to seek to make their home a sanctuary. And so this, there's no more normal. This thing is a traumatic event on a global scale. And the, the issue is we might get it out of our system now, but you know, as soon as somebody comes over our border with it again, yeah. it's going to spark all over again, right? So there's yep. not going to be any new normal. There's already talk about uh, us adopting various uh, social surveillance uh, methods that say China has. There's wow. talk about you know, us shifting to a face mask culture when we can finally get some, right? So wow. things aren't going to be normal for quite some time. That's interesting. Didn't they, uh, I'm curious too, because like in LA, uh, it being very locked down, didn't they like close Runyon? Like they're closing yeah. a lot well, of like the just course, group yeah. places, right? Yeah, Runyon Canyon, for those of you, you know, don't, you guys, most of you don't know me. I live right next to this canyon. Yeah. I hike, used to hike every day. Like this is my life. And now I got to find, you know, new ways to fulfill that same yeah. gratification without going on public land because, you know, of, of the risk of exposure. And I take that seriously because, you know, I have a 10 year old boy uh, who has a, who had asthma. He doesn't anymore, but, you know, he had underlying conditions. Every time he gets sick, it, it affects his, his breathing. And so last thing in the world I want to do is expose my son uh, to anything like this. And that's going to change my behavior as an individual. Yep. Right, because I, I know as a healthy person that I might be getting somebody I care and love about the most sick. Yep. And that's the last thing I want to do. Interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting time because it's like, what do you think about, for example, international travel, right? And how they close the borders. Do you yeah. think that they will close travel within the U.S.? Or what's yeah. your prediction on the next couple of weeks? I'm just very curious. Yeah, well, in, travel in between states is going to be locked. I, they're going to have to. See, because we didn't lock down everything immediately, now they're going to have to do it over the long run. We had an opportunity to end this in, in the short term, and we drug it out, right? And one of the biggest myths, and I have friends in the medical world, like for the youth to be told this doesn't affect young, healthy people, when now we're seeing stories of young, healthy people dying, right? A lot of youth were just, who cares? It doesn't affect me. I'm not going to uh, pay attention to this. I'm going to go about my life and live my life the way I want to live my life. And now that we're seeing stories and the strain of the virus that hit here, and, and the whole idea that it didn't affect young, healthy people was given to us by China, right? So, like, yeah. who knows if that's the truth or not? They're one of the most secret societies out there. And we now know in America that's not the truth. Young, healthy people are dying. And so we need to, um, you know, we need to make some serious adjustments to the way we conduct ourselves and not take this lightly just because we're, you know, young and healthy. Interesting. Um in a more positive light, because I know yeah. <laughs> for, for people that are coming in here that let's say um, they're not familiar with UltraCall and what you guys have been doing the last couple of months with these transformations, what would you recommend and what can you teach people today for them to how to maximize this time? You know, a lot of people are spending time at home. They're working from home. I know that you, you know, wake up at 4 a.m. and meditate for hours yeah. on end. Like what kind of habits or daily rituals can you give to these people that you'd recommend doing in this time of, you know, yeah. stress and anxiety and uncertainty? What would you tell the people here today? Well, so for one, I took two years in self quarantine to master a series of principles. And you know, Casey, you saw I put a basketball hoop up in my living room <laughs> and I'd be shooting baskets by myself yep. at 4 a.m. I put in a speed bag, uh, I put in a gym. I have every, nearly every musical instrument that I could experiment with and play with from sound bowls to gongs, to drums, to yep. guitars. Like, you know, so I, I picked up my old hobbies. I reconnected with the, the child in me that, you know, cause I grew up in a traumatic upbringing and, uh, you know, had some difficulty growing up with some violence that my father had and alcoholism and my mother and drug addiction. And so, you know, I, I reconnected with the hobbies that I had put down as a kid. And I recommend reconnect with that child. You have an opportunity right now. It is a tremendous opportunity to pick up new practices, learn to meditate, eat healthy, like make a commitment that you're going to come out of this healthier. See, yep. I knew when I went on my own 
uh, voluntary self-quarantine for two years, I, I spent most of my time just doing deep work and practicing methods, practices, and modalities. I knew that at the end of that two-year period, I was going to come out stronger, and I was going to be able to do what my soul was called to do. And so now is your opportunity to do that work. But don't waste time. It's real easy. And there's so many influences on us to waste our time. You know, don't waste the time. You have a brilliant opportunity. Like if I would have told you two weeks ago, do 30 days of breath work, people would have been like, no, thank you. I'll get to that later on in life. But if yep. I said, learn to master meditation, you'd say, never. My life, I'm too busy. I got too many events on my calendar. I'll never learn yeah. to master meditation, right? Like you just say, I'm too busy. I got too many things to do. Now, you know, we don't have anything to do. We can master meditation. We can master breath work. We can, we could pick up books that we've put down or that we've procrastinated on reading. We can do the journaling. We can write the book that we've always dreamed about writing. We can write the script. Like greatness can come from this time. Yep. And there will be people, there will be stories a year from now. You're going to hear about a movie that was written in this time. You're going to hear about books that were written this time. You're going to see new leaders emerge, new voices come out of this time. It's just, the only question is, is will you be one of them? Yep. And if you are going to be a new voice, you got to work on your voice. Literally, you got to do the work in order to become a new voice. Yep. And so that's what this time is a gift for. Like, I see this time as an opportunity for me to double down on my practices, double down on the love and connection I have with my son and with my friends and with my team and, and with the people that have joined me in the altar call mission. And so this is like the greatest opportunity. And I had already, I made this opportunity happen for me once before with two years worth of pretty much isolation. And I know what a change it's made within me. And so I highly recommend just like commit to doing the work in this time. And if you do, you're going to come out charged. And when things do start to emerge and unfold, you're going to have the energy. You're going to have transformed as an individual. You're going to have elevated and you're going to have activated. And those are really the th three things that we teach at Alter Call. Yeah. yeah. I love it. I lo so when it comes to, for example, the Alter Call experiences, and I, I've seen them all over the Alter Call Instagram, the stories. Can, can you take us through like a what the experience is when before yeah. the before bc before BC. quarantine yeah. what was the altar call it, i know it was an event at your house but i'd love for you to break that down so that the people can understand yeah. the transformations that you put people through yeah well so what i learned was you know I, I started my career much like you young as an entrepreneur i was always entrepreneurial but i was an illegal entrepreneur then about 19 years old i realized i could do everything i did illegally legally and you know from 19 I sold my first company when I was 24 uh, in a $25 million transaction. By the time I was 32, I, you know, uh, I generate hundreds of millions. And, you know, I sold my last company by South in a $792 million transaction. And so I was always just ambitious, goal setting, charging, going, going, going. And what I, what I realized after my mother had passed away in, in a very traumatic event that I had all my growth had covered up a lot of mud. And I had used a lot of the negative forces in my life and negative forces I had experienced as fuel. You know, I wanted to prove to the world that I could do, I could do it. When people would doubt me, I'd be like, I'll prove you wrong. I wanted to prove my father wrong. I wanted to make my mother proud because, you know, I, I, I really wanted her to see that I was enough. And so I, I utilized a lot of pride driven forces, ego driven forces, um, you know, and, and things to fuel my ambition. And that fuel ran out when, you know, when I really reset, when my mother passed away. And I realized that I had to find some new fuel sources, ones that would propel me in a sustainable way, where I wasn't going to be constantly crashing and burning and self-sabotaging. Yep. So at Transformation Day, I take people through the very process and the very rituals that I learned over two years. It's just that I refined them and simplified them so I could teach a person how to do it in 24 hours. And now our Transformation Day experience, we have even refined it further down to just six hours. Uh, and so over, we actually have a transformational experience that we're doing virtually now in the privacy of people's home, where we take them six hours to a transformation experience, um, and it's over seven days. And then we take them through an elevation experience and then an activation experience. And at the end of seven days, basically, I give them everything that I learned over two years of trial and error to get to a place where my body my mind and my spirit is in complete harmony. 
I feel younger, I have more joy, more happiness, and I'm able to achieve things with the level of energy that I've never been able to achieve before. Like, my, my you, you knew me as I was going through this, you saw me before, we met before, yep. and you see the difference in me coming out of it. I, I teach people how to awaken that uh, spark within them and how to activate that within them. And really the key is growth covers mud. So as you're growing, you're covering this mud. I give you the shovel to dig that mud out, and then I give you the tools, the principles, and the practices to be able to elevate and then activate. And that's the state that I live in now, is a state of activation. And that's the state I always coveted. I'd always be like, how can, how can Warren Buffett just do this forever? Or yeah. how, is, how is Mark Zuckerberg just so activated, right? Like he just, he just goes through everything. How is Steve Jobs so activated? And as I would interview, you know, great luminaries such as the ones I've mentioned or, you know, some mentors of mine, I would find that there was a difference in them. There was just something different about them. And it was always their level of activation and the tools that they utilize to decompress and to get the mud out of their system, to get the negativity out of their system were, were different. And they, they just knew that their soul had a purpose and that they were born for the work that they were doing. And they did that work at a, at a different level than everybody else I'd ever come in contact with, including myself. And I'd made a $600 million company and I'd been the fastest growing, but I never had like straight up sustainable energy powering me the entire time. <laughs> Interesting. What, what would you say like nowadays when you answer that question and what advice would you give to people that, you know, during this time, there's, like I said, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of people that would be stressed financially or whatever it may be. How can you give them a burst of energy? What can they do to regain some of that energy, even when they think the world is coming down and they feel trapped and stuck at home and yeah. you know, their, their normal life is, has just been ripped away from them. So unexpectedly, like how can yeah. people bring positive energy and, you know, positive affirmations into their life during this period? Yeah. Well, one, life is about evolution. And every time you get hit with something negative, you have to, you have to see it as a positive. Like, I have to take that punch, whatever the, the proverbial punch is, and from that punch, it's going to teach me something. One, how not to get punched again, right? Like, with the same punch. So if I made a mistake, I own that mistake, which I've made many. And I seek to learn from that. And then I seek to elevate from that. I ask myself, what can I learn from this challenge? What can I learn from this experience? Um, how can I change from this? And no matter what comes my way, I have people, you know, throwing their jabs at me. I have people doubting me, criticizing me. I have, I have financial things that come my way that I didn't expect when the markets crashed. I wasn't, I wasn't prepared for a virus and a pandemic. To yeah. Nobody was. My, you know, my business went from growing and thriving. And, you know, now I got to completely restart it all over. And, you know, in a short uh, uh, period of time, I wasn't prepared for that. But I see each and everything that comes my way, every challenge and every adversity as a, like, like bring it. Like, I, I've, I've been through a lot of pain. I've, I've failed miserably. I've made terrible mistakes. Like, this isn't going to kill me. And so knowing that, I know I got to just take a stand. And I got to absorb this pain. And I got to turn this pain into some positivity. Yep. And so you have to take that mindset. You can't take a victim mindset right now. You have to take a mindset of like, let's go. I might have to get hit with a few pitches right now as a, you know, as a baseball player. I'm going to get hit with a few pitches, but it's going to teach me how to get at bat better and stronger, and I'm going to come out with more confidence from this time. Absolutely. And by the way, for everyone that's in here right now, when I read – Ryan's books are, some, are like the – uh, most amazing books. I've read them multiple times. And for people that don't know, Rock Bottom to Rockstar, your, your recent book, I'd love for you to touch on that because when, when Ryan says you've been through very depressing and troubling times, like yeah. I'd love for you to go into, you know, your upbringing, your childhood for those that have, may have not read the book because yeah. I know I have. And I'd love for you to talk about some of the things that, you know, you speak about in the book and give some people some context yeah. about when you say that. Yeah. Um, well, on my, on my life's journey, I've, I've just been hit with a ton of adversity. It started with being born to a, a violent uh, father who was very abusive. Um, he abused not only myself, but my mother, my brothers, and my sisters, so much so that they all fled to a life um, less than they could have. Some of them went to jail for long periods of time. Some of them turned to drugs. I turned to drugs and alcohol for a period of time. Um, you know, and, and my mother turned to alcoholism as a result of his violent abuse. 
And so, you know, I, I, as a result of that, when I was 13 years old, I was forced into a situation where I had to live on my own um, on the streets because I was afraid that my father was going to kill me. He had threatened me. Um, and then I was, um, you know, I, I was basically living in a shack by myself. And my sister tried to help take care of me. I was flunking out of school. You know, I went from a nice middle-class upbringing to poverty. I was forced into a gang, a gang that was involved in drive-by shootings and murders and all kinds of crazy stuff that I was exposed to. I was in fear of my survival. I was in fear of being killed. I was in fear of, of you know, the upper, the authorities in the gang, the, what they call OGs, retaliating on me if I didn't do their dirty work. Um, I went to juvenile hall a couple of times. I got arrested a number of times. You know, I, I was in a place where I really, you know, had nothing to lose. And that's what the name of my first book is. It's called Nothing to Lose, Everything to Gain, where I write about, you know, how I utilize that mindset to my advantage to build my businesses. And then Rock Bottom to Rockstar, I talk about the adversities and the lessons I learned from the business school of hard knocks. That's the subtitle um, along the way, because you're going to, the bigger you are, the harder life gets and the more adversity that you're going to face. So, you know, I, I've faced all kinds of adversity. A lot of it, I got to say, I created on my own. And some of it, I didn't have any choice in. But I, 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 I now look at those adversities with complete gratitude. Because I'm like, this is what made me. Yeah. Like, I'm not afraid of a lot of things that a lot of other people are afraid of. Because I've been to jail, right? Like, yeah. you know, like quarantine. I've been in solitary confinement. Like, I, I've been, <laughs> right? Yeah. This, the quarantine that I live in is much better than solitary confinement. <laughs> I, had to live, I had to live in a situation where I was not uh, allowed to see or talk or experience other human beings, you know, for 24 hours per day, eating meals that were terrible. So, yeah. like, and I think about those days, these days are easy in yeah. comparison. Totally. Yeah, so it's that's a, what I write about. Yeah. I also, Casey, I have a free documentary on YouTube called Nothing to Lose the Documentary. It goes through a lot of my personal story, too, if, if your audience wants to check it yeah, out. Absolutely. And, and for everyone that's in here, make sure you uh, drop some questions so that Ryan can answer some of those as well. I think we had a <laughs> – so let's see. Someone said I'm the real Batman. Yeah, someone said you're the real Batman. <laughs> yeah. I love yeah. it. Do you get that a lot? <laughs> uh, yeah. the, you know, if I was, I wouldn't say. <laughs> right? I love the it. The first rule of being Batman is never admit that you're Batman, right? Totally. <laughs> I, I'm curious, just like with everything that's happening, how do you think the country has reacted to this in terms of the businesses, in terms of the shutdowns? Like, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, we haven't done enough. We okay. dismissed it. Um, you know, people are dying, man, and it's going to suck. I, I have a huge heart for grief because I felt the most tremendous grief ever when I lost my mother. And, and my friends and family and people didn't know how to show up for me in that time and, and I was, I didn't know how to process it. And so grief is a really tough su subject that our culture has yet to come to terms with. And I'm very spiritual and I'm even more spiritual now having gone through the grief I've gone through. So, you know, it's, it's gonna hit people hard. You know, when, when we see, you know, the other, just recently a, a, an expert from the government's uh, uh, medical um, task force was saying that there's gonna be a minimum of 100 I think we lost you for a second. All right, let's see. Did we lose them? Ryan, I'm not sure if you can hear me, but you froze on my end. Yeah, I'm back. Oh, are you back? All right, we're yeah, good. So was <laughs> yeah, so what did I get cut off at? Uh, you were saying that government. government. You were at the government. Government. Got government. Well, I was just saying we haven't done enough. And it's going to cause lots of deaths, and those deaths are going to cause a lot of grief. So people are going to need a lot of healing. Um, and, you know, do the healing work in advance of when you need the healing. Yeah. That's my advice to you. Like, get, get the work now, and you're going to be 10 times stronger, you know, when, when adversities and obstacles do come your way. And no matter what in life, whether it happens now or it happens later, it's going to happen. So do the work. Got it. Someone said, what are your favorite books of all time? Uh, favorite books of all time are um, I Love the Tipping Point. Ironically, it talks about the spread of epidemics, which is very relevant right now. And it talks about epidemics around businesses, around messaging, 
around there's companies, there's causes, there's movements, there's how democracies are taken off. So Tipping Point is a good read right now. Um, I'm very spiritual, so there's a number of spiritual books that have, that have shaped me. I won't dive in deep into that. Um, good to Great was a great book. Talks about how books, yep. how co companies went through um, uh, difficult times and became great as a result of them. Um, anything by John Wooden, John Maxwell. I've read a lot of their works. I've been mentored by both of them personally. Um, yeah, there, there's a bunch of books that yeah. I'm, I'm a, I read constantly. So I have, you know, I have probably 10 books that I'm working through at any given time. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Someone said, um, hey, Ryan, what business opportunities do you think this crisis will create? I know we touched on that briefly, but. What business opportunities? Yeah. Um, you know, anything, anytime that there's a problem, there's a business opportunity to solve it. So it, it, like every day you see the problems as an entrepreneur, you need to see the opportunity within the problem. And from a creative thinking and strategic thinking exercise, every time you hear yourself talking about a problem, just think about what kind of opportunities are there in that particular problem. Serving people in their homes, um, being able to give them pleasure in their homes, being able to release their pain and the trauma that they're experiencing in their homes. Um, those are all opportunities. Content is going to be an opportunity because people are going to be consuming more content than ever. Yeah. So many opportunities. What's your thoughts on, I'm curious, um, the way college responded to it, the colleges and universities doing, you know, Zoom and canceling graduations and how now these, you know, class of 2020 seniors are excited to get into the workforce, but now and unemployment's up and businesses are shut down. How do you think this affects that generation that was planned to, you know, start yeah. their careers getting out of college? How do you think? Yeah, mark, mark my words on this one. This is going to disrupt the institution of higher education permanently. I mean, this is going to be the most radical disruption to the institution of, of education as a whole, but of higher education as well as a whole permanently. Because like, if you just spent hundreds of thousands of dollars <laughs> on your last semester at Harvard to go on a Zoom, and we're doing free Zooms, Every morning I do a, a Zoom on meditation.altacall.com. It's a shameless plug. Yeah, but like, of course. There's so many of us are doing, we're doing a free live right now, right? And, Every day? Yeah. Uh, I'm amazing. doing a free, I'm doing free meditation and, and uh, I do a Very free cool. prayer and meditation every single day with a, a group of people. But yeah, like, like the, there's going to be so many of us that have a heart to serve and have the time to serve now that we're no longer are distracted with, you know, travel and being in our cars and yep. all of that stuff that, it's going to disrupt um, the institution of, of higher education for sure. And I'm, I'm already seeing my son, you know, I had to help him through homeschool today, like, or through <laughs> online school. And man, like, I couldn't get anything done. Like, kids are out of school. And parents now have to be there with the child while they're in school. So it's going to take parents out of the workforce until kids yep. can get back in school. And none of us are sending our kids back into school if that's harm's way. Yep. Like none of us are going to want to do that, right? So it's going to change education as we know it. That is going to be the most dramatically changed uh, public institution that we have. Got it. What about the, the big headline, the $2 trillion stimulus? What's your yeah. thoughts on that, on how they made that decision? Yeah, we should have spent $2 trillion on our medical system. And we should have had a medical system capable of withstanding this situation and had a plan for this. And it's a shame. It's a shame on our politicians it's a shame on everybody in our government that they didn't spend that two trillion on a medical system that could justly serve the people. And instead we just allowed profiteering and shareholder buybacks. Like our shareholders got rich while you know the, the doctors and the nurses are being gouged on masks and surgical gowns. And like I know people on the front lines that are that are literally dying right now because they don't have, you know, the the, the masks and the equipment to serve people. And they're gonna start to have to make decisions on who lives and who dies based on the amount of equipment that's available. Mm. How sad is that when you yeah, think like one of our friends or family is gonna be on the list of who dies because there wasn't enough medical equipment to serve them and yep. somebody that had money got the service. Like this, these are the dilemmas that we're gonna start to soon hear about. And so it's a shame. We should have spent that money the right way I, I'm, agree I'm in agreement we needed a bailout, but like $2 trillion is a drop in the bucket. We're a $15 trillion economy or more. And yep. unfortunately, $2 trillion is only going to last us a few weeks. 
And so we're going to be printing money, which is going to create inflation. And, it, you know, we're going to be paying a price for this epidemic for years as a result of this. So Interesting. You know, it's going to, it's, nobody knows how this thing is going to work. The government doesn't, the economists don't, don't, nobody knows, right? So it's anybody's guess, therefore it's anybody's playing field. We do know though that there are some goods and services that people are going to no matter, need no matter what. And the goal is, is for us to be of service and to align with those goods and services that people are gonna need no matter what. God, very interesting. Someone asked a question. So how do you, how do you be effective in productivity when balancing your child works? For me, it's my brothers and your work, ex school work and hobbies. Not sure what she meant by that, but. Well, God bless her. Great question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, how do I balance productivity? I, I like to spend at least an hour. So I have a hobby that I love and, it, and the hobby is singing and it teaches me how to actually work on my voice. And so as a orator, a, a person speaking to you here today, singing actually has a benefit. So I try to find hobbies that actually benefit me in my work. Music benefits you. It increases your intelligence. It, it's not, you know, th there's so many benefits to learning music and appreciating music. Martial arts as well teaches you discipline. You know, these are the hobbies that I have are, they're not time wasters. You know, it's not like I'm learning to crochet. You know, I'm, I'm doing things that are, that are very, um, you know, they're hobbies that, that give me better flow state, better mind uh, body balance, like things like that and give me happiness. And if I'm happy, I'm a better leader with my team, right? So find hobbies that are in alignment with who you want to be and then do those hobbies. Love it. If we have any questions, make sure you guys start asking some questions. And um, Ryan, I know that you said earlier too, and I want to make sure I mention this since it's obviously a time where everyone's stuck at home. You're doing a daily meditation. I know you yeah. mentioned it before, but I'd love for you to give some context of what that is and where people can go to to be yeah. a part of this daily meditation you're doing. Yeah, awesome. So I teach a meditation. Um, it's a simple practice. I've traveled the world. You've seen some of my rare books behind me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Like I have books from like there, you can see some of those. Those are books from all around the world yep. uh, from various modalities. And so one of those books is older than America. It's 1733. And so I've studied various practices with an eye toward simplifying them for the entrepreneur. And so I teach simple meditation and a simple breath work. We get together every morning at meditation.altercall.com. If you go there and register, it's for a Zoom. <laughs> That's my dog. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, You're good. My dog says hi. Um, so we teach meditation every day. Meditate. Berlin. Thank you. Sorry, guys. My dog wants you're to good. Uh, interrupt this. This is how, by the way, what you're seeing right now is me being calm. Now that I meditate, I don't react. I'm just calm about this. Yep, I used yep. to react to these types of things. Meditation.altercall.com. A-L-T. Berlin. Come in. Uh, we, Someone said, hi, Berlin. Right. Yeah, hi, it. Berlin. Say hi to everybody. My dog's famous now, Casey. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, we teach meditation uh, at Alter Call. Brian just pe penned it. Yep. Meditation.altercall, A L T E R C A L L dot com. Got it. Awesome. Someone asked a question. Someone said, What do you think would be the best investment right now if you are in your 20s? Into you. Invest into the new you. Right now, you have an opportunity to learn more, read more, and do work that a lot of people in your 20s are not going to be doing. Like, so sorry, my dog. Hey, Berlin, no worries here. at all. <laughs> yeah. Come here. Sorry. So you, when I was in my twenties, I invested in me. I went to Tony Robbins. I, I studied, I read his books. I listened to his audio tapes. I was in, obsessed with learning. I coming from a street environment. I had to learn vocabulary. I had to learn business acumen. I had to, I read books on business. I was obsessed in learning. And so right now you want to invest in you and become obsessed with learning. Love it. Someone said, um, Jeff said, I'm on the verge of a software launch. Best advice for a launch of software that may not 100% fully work. Thanks so much. I've, I've launched a lot of software that didn't fully work. <laughs> <laughs> some, of it, some of it I thought worked and then I launched it. Yeah, it um, nothing, you, know, uh, uh, you know, for one, you know, try to hold back on a launch if it doesn't fully work. Yeah. People will not, when, when they, it's easier for them to buy something they conceptualize in pre-sales. And then once they <laughs> see it, if it sucks, they're going to want a refund. They're going to be disappointed. And so I've launched software that didn't work. And once I did that, it destroyed my launch. And then I had to, you know, uh, kill the software or rename the software or whatever. Yep. So 
I don't recommend, like, you know, you can pre-sell it. People will buy something that's coming. Uh, but once it's there, they have the logic and the reasoning to evaluate it. And if you haven't done your job and it's not working, uh, it's going to disappoint them and you're going to lose a lot of your potential early adopters. Software is all about early adoption. So my advice, though, is pare back your features. Like, that, like, cut every feature that doesn't work. I'd rather have a piece of software with three features that work really good than a bunch of features and some of them work, some of them don't work. Like, just go to the, you know, people will be fine if they know features are coming. For example, the iPhone, you know, it, it didn't have um, multi-application threading for quite some time, if you recall. On the iPhone, like, we knew other products had multi-application threading, meaning I could launch two applications at once. I didn't have to shut down my music to to launch my video, right? And yeah. you have to shut down my music to write email. But iPhone for a while, you had to shut down music. You know, music shut down when you launched email. And it was this, you know, constantly start and stopping different apps. And But we knew at some point in time, they were going to do that update. And when they did do the update, we were so happy with Apple because they brought <laughs> us something that we wanted, right? Now, it's weird because they should have brought that to us in the first place, right? But they didn't. They just kept giving us new features so if you pare back your features and then launch new features incrementally, you'll win the hearts and minds of your customers because they'll start to really thrive with the new features that are coming. But don't watch, don't, you know, Steve Jobs had an expression. He said, don't ship shit. So like, don't Got launch it. a piece of software that sucks. Yep. I love that. So I said, what martial arts does he practice? <laughs> uh, right now I practice Taibo. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> if you're familiar, if for those of you who are young, if you're familiar, that was Billy Blanks, like in the 80s. Uh, no, I, I, I practice uh, in my home. I have a little dojo, and I practice a mix between different martial arts that I've trained in. I've done some Muay Thai. I've done some Taekwondo. I've done some Kung Fu. And uh, I practice a mix of all of them. But it's, you know, it's more the art part rather than the martial part. It's like I'm not – I don't want to get – I've had my teeth broken out. I've had concussions. I'm not interested in getting in fights anymore. I'm yep. interested in just – being in the most flow state, the most fit that I possibly can be in. Got it. I, I think you'll have uh, this next question. Bail out the people. She says, your positivity is imp inspiring. Currently, I am going through a difficult time. My son's dad passed away on Halloween, and now going through this crisis as a single parent is overwhelming. What advice would you give a single mom going through back-to-back -back crises? Um, I appreciate well, one, you sharing, um, whoever that was. Yeah, one – like my heart's with you right now. That's, that's, um, you know, losing your, your, your son's was it your son's father is the hardest thing that, you know, a human being can endure and just know that grief gets better. Like the further you go. And this was one of the expressions that I hold near and dear to my heart. I would just remind myself every day, the further you go, the further you see. When I was grieving the loss of my mother, who was so important to me, and I loved her so much. And there were things I wish I could have said to her before she passed that I didn't. I would just remind myself, the further you go, the further you see. Know that your husband is with you right now, right beside you. And so know that every day that you take a step further, that you should have the comfort in knowing that you're making him proud. You're making him proud at the mother you are for your child. You're making him proud at, at the steps that you're taking. And know that there are forces at work that you can't see, and your husband is one of them. And that every day that you take a step in that right direction, you're making him proud. Um, I know that. And I know that that's how I got through some of the darkest, most difficult days, uh, being a single father as well, and having to grieve and having to try to be strong around my son. And many times I wasn't. And now I'm on the other end of it. And I'm stronger than I've ever been two years later, a little over two years later. So it takes time. Have patience with yourself. You know, this just happened on Halloween. So my heart goes out to you. You know, you're in my thoughts, my prayers. I'm sending you love right now. Every day, just take a single baby step. And, you know, I have a lot of heart for that. If you connect with me, if you DM me, I'm happy to dive deeper in, in some of the things that I've done to get through grief. Grief is the hardest thing that we can, we can overcome. And I've been able to do that. I now can look back at losing my mother with, and, and see it as like a transformational event and one that, you know, that, that I needed to go through and God had a plan. And, you know, that plan happened the way it happened was crazy for me. I didn't expect it to happen that way. It was traumatic, 
Uh, but because of God's plan, I'm now more spiritual. I'm a better father. I no longer drink. I don't do drugs. I don't do toxic things. I seek a life of purity. Like I'm a whole different human being because of what I went through. And so know that you can become a whole different being and you can make your husband so proud and make your son so proud as a result of this, this, this event. You just have to see it as something that's going to transform you into the positive. Love it. Love it. I will do uh, two more quick questions. Uh, my buddy Ishan says, define happiness. Happy, so happiness is uh, the, the peace of mind of knowing that you've done your best. Like that you, you came here, your soul picked this vessel, <laughs> your body, because it, it picked your parents because it wanted to do some work, right? And you did that work and you're doing that work. And every day you're making progress. Like that's happiness. When you're stuck, when you're depressed, when you have anxiety, it just means that your soul is not activated and doing the work that it's capable of. And that's not your fault a lot of times. A lot of times that's because you signed up for a different job than the one your soul was called to do because somebody told you do this or don't do that. And so you followed other people's advice. You went to school and it didn't work for you. You know, you paid $100,000 for college and now you don't have a job, right? And so you bought into somebody else's system, somebody else's business model, and maybe that, you know, led you in the wrong direction. And so you're unhappy and that's fine. Now, how do you become happy? You do the work, you know, you do the work to find out what your soul's purpose is, what your real calling is. And then you take steps every single day in, in pursuit of that calling, knowing that some days it's going to be harder than others, right? Like some days I have to deal with pain and difficult things from my past. You know, I had somebody criticizing me that was a friend of the past and I had to hear that today. And I was like, all right, well, I got to do the work, right? Yeah. I didn't like it. Uh, I wasn't excited by this conversation because I'm so future oriented. I don't think about my past, but oh, well, I had to heal something there. I had to deal with it. I had to reflect on it yep. and I had to move on. So every day, you just got to try to elevate 1%. Every day, just try to get better by 1%. And 10 years from now, you're going to live a life beyond your wildest dreams. At 19 years old, I started this pursuit. And by the, t by the time that I was like, you know, I guess by the time I was 24, I'd already made, you know, a significant sum of money. By the time I was uh, uh, 30, I'd made even more and I even had more success. But now that I'm 42, I've continued on this pursuit. And every single day, I feel like I'm, I'm just growing every day. That's all you Love can it. do. Love it. I think we'll do one more and then wrap it up. It, sa it says, let me see, we have four right here. Someone said, feeling frustrated, entrepreneur at heart, but need the right squad. How to find your team. So maybe your team, your tribe, how do you find your, you know, your squad? Like <laughs> Liam says. Yeah. Um, one is like be the person that you want to work with. So you know, really work deeply first. The more, and this was something that, you know, I, I really went to work on me because I wanted to attract the highest caliber people that I possibly could. And I, the team that I'm surrounded by now at Alter Call is some of the best human beings I've ever had the privilege to work with. We're aligned, we elevate each other, you know, and we do great quality work. Some of the best work I've ever done and in the most elevated work in a consistent fashion. And that's because I went to work on me. And so you're going to, you know, the more that you work on you, the more that you're going to um, attract those people that are like you and that are like-minded. The other thing is you have to share. You have to share your voice. You have to share what you're looking for. You have to put it out there and say, you know, share, share who, who you want to attract. Write your ads and your copy and your posts to the people that you want to attract. You know, get real deep and like, who is the individual that I want to attract? I, in Rock Bottom to Rockstar, uh, I talk about, you know, you have to attract people that you're seeking to recruit, much like an FBI profiler would seek to reverse engineer an individual that he's trying to find. Like when they're trying to find the Unabomber, they had to think like the Unabomber. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to attract a good software engineer or a good marketer or a good salesperson, you have to think like that person that you're seeking to attract. And you have to ask yourself, where's that person? What are they doing? Like, how are they doing it? How do, I, how do I meet them where they're at right now and connect to them deeply so that they want to work with me and not everybody else they have the opportunity to work with? Love it. Well, we'll, we'll wrap it up here, man. Ryan, I want to say thank awesome. you so much for tuning in. And real quick, just to, before you head out, just 
meditation.ultracall.com. You're doing the yeah. daily live meditations. What time is that at for the people that may want to know? Awesome. 9 a.m. Pacific time every single day. Got it. It's a Zoom link, so you just have to register at meditation.ultracall.com. And if you, uh, if, if you want to follow me on uh, Instagram, you know, I, I engage, uh, you know, all the time on my posts, as you know, Casey. So yep. I love you guys. Totally. And I'm here to, you know, help everybody elevate their journeys. And I appreciate Perfect. doing this with you, my man. Absolutely. Thank, thank you so much for the time, Ryan. I'll see you soon. God bless. Yeah, thank you, brother. Alrighty. See you very soon. All, all right. right. Bye-bye. Bye. Perfect. Guys, that was such a great conversation. Thank you to everyone that was in here the entire time. If you have any more questions, make sure you go shoot Ryan a DM. And then also for those that are still in here tomorrow, I'm doing an Instagram live with Ryan Serhant. We're going to be talking about real estate during this crisis and it's going to be amazing. So stay tuned. I'll be putting some more information on my story and I will see you guys tomorrow. Peace.